syncing up here. All right, so we are going live here on Facebook. If you're just tuning in, please uh, just give us a second here while this all gets organized and the stream starts to broadcast all around the world here. Um, if you are tuning into the chat, it would be great if you would just leave a quick message and say where you're from and uh, any sort of interesting details about yourself. We'd love to sort of meet who's in the chat. And if you are joining us today from anywhere in the world, you are invited to ask questions at the end of today's broadcast. I'll be hosting a Q&A with both of our guests here. Um, please just write, you know, who you're directing your question for and also what your question is. And uh, I'd really love it if we could try and dig into the music and the careers and interactions of our great guests today and uh, try not to focus on questions about you know reads and, and things like that so let's focus on the musical uh, elements of of this conversation that would be the, the best way to go so i'm the clarinet podcast host sean perrin and i'm here today with richard hawkins who of course is the he's been the host of the past several uh, episodes of this uh, clarinet master series and also the bacoon at home with hawkins series on the bacoon website and we are joined today by Michael Wayne, who is of the Boston Symphony Orchestra and also the Eastman School of Music. So this whole series has been a really great way to hear some really interesting stories that we otherwise wouldn't get the chance to hear, um, just simply because of Richard's rapport with these great guests that we've had. So I'll let uh, Richard go over maybe how him and Michael have connected over the years. And, and uh, But we're, we're going to have a 40-minute conversation with Richard and Michael and then a 20 minute Q&A at the end. So I'll be moderating that. And again, if you're just tuning in, please post your questions in the Facebook comments and I'll be going through and moderating those today. So Richard, I'm gonna pass this on over to you and uh, thank you both so much for coming on today's conversation. Thank you so much, Sean. Michael, it's so good to see you. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen you, but it's it's so always so great. And and sort of we've known each other for a long time now and and, I'm just so happy to have you here. Um, I guess I wanted to sort of start with a couple of questions I've had in my mind a, a bit. Um, not a lot of people have met you in person, um, but a lot of people have worked with you in, in, in uh, uh, various uh, you know, institutions. And, and uh, I thought maybe you could start with uh, a, little, a little bit about you and your history and, uh, and we'll go from there. Great, well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here and uh, to see you. Um, so just a little background and how we met too. Um, I grew up in just outside Phoenix, Arizona, uh, in Scottsdale and just started like a lot of people in school band, uh, in fourth grade, uh, picked up the clarinet and it wasn't until high school that I really started, I started taking lessons my sophomore year. Um, and I think looking back that I've had a lot of good fortune, but the, the teachers I, at the time seemed sort of random, but worked out so well. I, I studied with um, Steve Henisofsky, who's in the Phoenix Symphony, my sophomore year of high school. Um, and that summer I went to Interlochen for camp. And that's where we met. Mm -hmm. uh, I auditioned for the academy and we had sort of a mini lesson. And then I ended up spending my junior, senior year of high school with you at Interlochen. Um, and then from there, I did my undergrad with Fred Ormond at University of Michigan. Um, but th the fortunate thing with, the, with the, the teachers was that Steve had studied with Fred at Florida State. Um, I then studied with you, you studied with Fred at Michigan, and then I studied with Fred. And it was just a very consistent upbringing on the clarinet yeah so when you were thinking about that 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 time you know sort of your history um what was what, what was the sort of time like the the breaking point where you started to really get serious about it like where was that and and what did you do like what was what was the drive that 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 the passion behind it that worked for you i actually was thinking about this earlier today um um, I've been dealing, I've been, I've been working with this with my students a lot with all the video lessons mm -hmm. is finding, reminding yourself why you're playing and what mm -hmm. brought you to the clarinet and mm -hmm. really embracing that while you're alone and not having all this, the normal interaction. So I was thinking about that myself today. And, you know, when I was younger, when I started playing, I just enjoyed doing it. I used to come home from school and play along with recordings. There was, uh, Weber 
concertos recording that I got the music for and I would just play along to. I got Pete Fountain transcriptions, like a book. Yeah. I would play along with that for fun. It was just, it was something for fun for me to do. But meanwhile, I was, I was doing sports very seriously. I competitively swam for a while. So that was my focus. Mm -hmm. um, but then that, that went away and then into high school, I think into that sophomore year where I started taking lessons, mm -hmm. that's when I really focusing on clarinet and then interlocking for the summer. And then when I got to the academy, it was all on. I mean, it was mm -hmm. in, incredible focus from then, then on. So talking about sort of your, your athletic experience and what, what do you feel brought you a uh, certain sort of motivation from that into the clarinet? Is there any specific things that, that you think that helped you in that way? Um, honestly, I think a lot of it's my family. I have two mm -hmm. brothers um, who there is always a drive, a very strong drive in a um, trying to be the best at what you do. And I think that was ingrained in me. So, and it's still today, anything I do, I don't do a lot of things, but the few things that I'm really passionate about, I try to do at a very high level and a very specific, you know, I'm not trying to be the jack of all trades. I'm trying to, there's one thing I like to do and I get super, super focused on it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was sort of ingrained as I was young and it's still there today where I just, um, whether it's in music or outside of music, there's certain things that I really, really focus on. And I think that from a young age, that was just part of my upbringing. Yeah. Um, what was hard for you when you were in high school? Like what, what things that you had to overcome, you know, as a, as a young player? Um, the thing that comes to mind immediately was when yeah. I came to study with you and I was anchor tonguing. <laughs> I, it was the most frustrating thing because people had told me that over the years, but they did mm -hmm. it. There just wasn't the time. There was always yeah. Yeah. Like this audition coming up. There's not time to switch. And I remember that we spent almost the entire junior year of high school switching my articulation. And it was so frustrating because everyone around me was playing all this big repertoire mm -hmm. i'm sitting there playing just you know, like slow scales and articulating <laughs> right <laughs> Only these... all the fun stuff <laughs> I, I, what what's wrong with me you know like i'm not playing all this stuff but it was so valuable to take that time because yeah i couldn't have done that any other time you know mm -hmm. the senior year i've been getting ready for auditions for college it was that junior year that was getting those fundamentals in, in the right place. So that was, a, that was a struggle and continued to be for a long time to really refine that part of my playing. Do you find that something that you hear a lot in, in your own students and or students that you worked with outside of Eastman as far as anchor tonguing? You know, like, is that something you still hear about? Yeah. People? Occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think this is why I'm, um, there's certain things like that in my playing that I had to work through. And I think because of that, I know exactly how it works and that's what I enjoy doing with my teaching. And so if someone does come in with that, I've experienced it. Yeah. So I know what you need to do, uh, the exercise you need to do and the philosophy behind it and mm -hmm. technique, uh, to make any adjustments you need to make. So it, it it's an up. interest. That's a particularly interesting topic because I, I see it a lot, it, you know, when I go out and, and work with students. In fact, um, many years I was uh, working with a lot of uh, students in um, Colombia, um, South America, and I haven't quite figured out the phenomenon behind it, but I think, <clears throat> I think a lot of it has so much to do with language and, and, you know, 90% of the kids, you know, in, in Colombia, we're anchor tonguing. It was really kind of amazing. And, and then these are kids that just never had lessons and they were just, you know, they were going to the community schools, you know, cause they have sort of a El Sistema program type of program there. And, and, and they didn't have people telling them how to play. And so they immediately picked up the instrument and started doing that. And I find that really fascinating that it was sort of a natural 
you know, a natural tendency for someone to do that. And I actually think that I've heard a lot of people do it very successfully. I, I, I think it is um, something that can work really well for a lot of things. Like it's certainly, you know, speed, like, you know, a lot of people anchor tongue and it's like an amazing clarity of sp when you get past like 132 and up it's like really great but unfortunately so much of our repertoire is you know between 80 and 120 you know and it's like that's where it's really evident when somebody's doing it um anyway so that's another topic but um that's interesting so when you when you were um in high school that was something you were you were going through where was the next sort of stepping stone for you like after high school like where where did you really feel like you really wanted to be an orchestra and you really wanted to do this like for a career? I always, I, I always knew I wanted to do it for a career. I mean, I was so focused at a young age that I was just very single-minded. Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, you know, in the last year I've had a lot of uh, changes and transitions in my career and it's, I've reflected a lot with this and I, um, it, it was, it's just interesting to think back because I, I started taking professional orchestral auditions the beginning of my sophomore year of college. Mm -hmm. um, and then I basically took everything I could until I got a job. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I remember having very tough conversations with Fred, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. telling him that I did not want to play in an orchestra. Mm -hmm. I had mm -hmm. no interest in playing in an orchestra. Um, and he really encouraged me to, um, to go the orchestral route. Um, I think when I was young, and it's still, I'm, I'm now again reflecting on this now, uh, the greatest musical moments at that point for me, and even still have been great chamber music concerts, solo concerts, and that's what I, that's what I wanted more of. Um, and so, that was sort of a battle for me during my studies. I was doing a lot of solo competitions to try to go that route, but then I was still taking, I was doing everything I could. Anytime I saw something to do, I was signing up for a competition, audition, I'll do this solo competition, two weeks later I'll do this orchestral audition, I'll just, I'll do it all. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then the path of getting an orchestra job worked out and so I took that path and that I was, that's been uh, 17 years, mm -hmm. 17 years ago. So it's, um, that was the direction I went. That's, that's interesting. I mean, talking about that, that side of, uh, of your career, um, you know, so you got, you got an orchestra job and what, what kind of changes did you have to go through to make adjustments for playing an orchestra? And, you know, as, as far as a player and the things that you were thinking about, you know, because you had such a wide sort of palette of, of interest in, in, in the repertoire and the clarinet generally, you know, how did, how, what were the things that you really had to concentrate on in the orchestra that, that, you know, made your career successful? Yeah. I, um, so I started in, Can my first job was in Kansas City, Kansas right. City. And I didn't go to graduate school. I just went from my undergrad to that job. And mm -hmm. I was really inexperienced you know mm -hmm. i had subbed with the phoenix symphony a few times but i had no real professional experience um fortunately i had a greg williams who was in the section with me he was on the minnesota orchestra he was also about my age a little older and he really guided me on what i needed to do like just little things that out of school i had no idea like do I bring a clarinet stand on stage? When do I put my clarinet down? Do I bring a pencil? Do I bring earplugs? I, I just showed up. Yeah. <laughs> Even just etiquette. What do you do when you get to work? When do you get to work? And I felt like a lot of that was sort of my grad school. I could, yeah, makes that, sense. Fortunately, I had someone next to me who was understanding that, mm -hmm. um, you know, who wasn't just, this is wrong, this is wrong. It was really... Um, building a team in the section, um, which really helped me um, adjust to this new life. Um, uh, was there any particular things about 
like sort of tonally that you had to adjust for that? I mean, do you remember going through that sort of change? <laughs> it's a different world sitting in a practice room mastering excerpts mm -hmm. and then sitting on stage every day. And that's where that, I think playing in Kansas City was a huge transition in my brain. Mm -hmm. uh, because I found that as much as I had fantastic teachers who gave me a really great foundation, um, I didn't fully understand, I don't think I fully understood all the teaching. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I was lost. And then some things I felt I was doing wasn't working on stage. At the time, the hall was very poor acoustically. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of, I had to, felt like I had to force my sound a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I think being there made me analyze all of the teachings I had been given and figuring out why I was doing them. Mm -hmm. was the point of my career of trying to figure out the why. Mm -hmm. So, you know, do this tongue position, do this type of air, this in your embouchure. And it, that was the opportunity for me to experiment and find this works and this is why, or this doesn't work and this is why. <clears throat> mm -hmm. On stage every day, in an orchestra, producing a, a, an amount of sound and use of air. And um, mm -hmm. that was a big transition for me. Um, again, from sitting in just a practice room by myself to sitting mm -hmm. on the stage. So. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, thinking of it from a, a slightly different direction of, of all the teachers that you had and, and the people that you worked with and certainly a lot of the professionals and in, in chamber music and things other other people that you were surrounded uh, with um, or surrounded by I, I I think of it also as a sort of fundamental flexibility exercise for a lot of students in in that you're learning how to adjust your you know your ears are becoming more aware of what you have to do to make make the instrument um, function in that space and that time and that group of people. And certainly um, that's a big part of what we do all the time, you know, to going from room to room or, or going from a room to zoom, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's sort of like something that we're all dealing with. And I, it was uh, Carrie Bell actually last week, we were sort of talking on, on email a little bit and, you know, he, he, I asked him how he was doing and, uh, and he responded and said, well, I just figured out how to, you know, make the sound that I want at home, you know, because he's playing in the orchestra all this time. And it suddenly, you know, suddenly you don't have that and you've got to make those adjustments. Right. And and certainly that's a big part of it, uh, what we do for, for our musical lives. Um, any particular like musical advice that you've gotten from anybody in the past that sticks with you in sort of your day to day work? Um, Conductors, other other musicians, you know. Yeah, um, that's a good question. I mean, my ongoing philosophy playing uh, is is basically one step at a time. Uh -huh. I'm not um, whether it's in my preparation. Um, or how I'm looking at a piece of music is that I think it's all our natural instinct to just try to get it perfect immediately and just figure out all the answers immediately. And that I take my time um, learning a piece, getting to know a piece and figure out what I, the, what I wanna do musically with it and how I wanna prepare it technically. Um, you know, uh, see it in the background there, but the music director in Boston, Anders Nelson's, um, among other things, it's it's fascinating to watch him uh, with the orchestra and talk to the orchestra, because I, I find that he's talking about a lot of musical nuances that helps, that ultimately helps any technical issue. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the funny thing I always, I always think back about is that, you know, if something was out of tune in the orchestra, a lot of conductors would stop, try to tune it, and then tell you you're sharp or flat. And with Nelson's, it was always, if he ever said something, 
it was either you're a little too pessimistic or you need to be a little more optimistic with your mm -hmm. kid. Um, and so a way of addressing things that isn't confrontational and mm -hmm. you want to do better and you want to do well and, and make it better. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, I, I think the mistake I made early on was just trying, I, I have to get this perfect right now mm -hmm. all the time. And it just um, ultimately just for me never stuck. It was great in the practice room, but under pressure, it just was never there. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's something I, I am constantly working on and, and trying to work with my students on. Mm -hmm. So what do you have on your stand right now? Like, what are the things that you're working on? What, what are the things that you have to work on daily to keep, keep in shape and that sort of thing? So I have a, uh, I have a routine. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a part of my warm up that I have done upwards of for when, when I started working with you. There's still one thing when I was 15 years old. I still mm -hmm. do. I do it in a, a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are certain things that I do every single day. Mm -hmm. It's sort of my essential. It keeps everything in the right place. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of things I developed over the years um playing in an orchestra i found i i developed a lot of bad habits you're playing you're not hearing yourself a lot you're playing with a hundred people on stage there's a lot of sound um and if you're not playing in a great especially if you're not playing in a great space there's a lot of things that come into your playing and so i ended up um while i was in boston i always remember at the end of every tanglewood season I felt like I needed to relearn how to play the clarinet once. Mm. Mm -hmm. I just, we played Beethoven 9 every, there was always the last concert at Tanglewood. It was after that that I had a couple weeks, two or three weeks to get back to certain, before the season started in the fall. And I took those weeks to figure out how to play the clarinet again. I just sort of dropped everything and started from scratch because I had developed so many weird manipulative habits mm -hmm. and so a lot of these things that i do on a daily basis immediately puts everything where it should be so i'm, I'm uh it's a very very short exercises that if they don't work i know exactly what is off uh -huh. and so i do those every single day just to put me right in place exactly where i need to be and then um, a lot of the technical things i do as a warm-up I vary. I vary every few weeks. Uh -huh. So I, I do that as much as I can every day. I have young kids at home, so right now it's it's a bit hectic. So I do my best to get that in. Um, I've been going through those uh, the Bela Kovacs uh, homages, that mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been playing through Bach. And right now I just started working on, I'm playing a chamber concert at Tanglewood in beginning of July. And so I'm getting ready for that. Just some woodwind quintet pieces. Nice. That's the thing I'm working on now just to get in shape. Yeah. So are, as you have experienced these various times of your career, you know, and, and the versatility of it and, and all the different, you know, changes that you've gone through. Um, and I've asked this of a lot of the guests, um, is have you discovered things about anything particular in your own technique that you weren't taught and nobody else has talked about it <laughs> or anything that you think you do that's different you know from other people like for me you know i've talked about it with a couple other people but sort of shading certain things certain f physical techniques that you do to make certain things work in a different way or is there anything that comes to mind that you that you might Tell us about. Yeah, um, I think I don't want this to come across because I, we're, I'm just talking to you. But looking back at my time with you, I think we all, all the students who studied with you, at least at that time at Interlochen, um, we were fortunate to hear someone with a beautiful sound and beautiful legato all the time in lessons. And I think all of the students who came out of there had that. There was just, just ease of playing. And I think um, I think that's hopefully still in my playing. 
that I that I got from you. I think <laughs> something that I um, I think I do naturally, but I've spent years refining and refining it my on my own mm -hmm. is not only the quality of sound, but how I can resonate on the clarinet. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's one thing that I, a huge learning experience I had in Kansas City is that when I got there, I was always asked to play more. And so, as a, especially as a young person, I felt like, oh, I just need to push more sound out. It needs to be louder. Uh, it was only until I got to Boston, especially playing in that hall, in that section, in that orchestra, that I really understood the difference between a decibel level and resonance mm. and how you control resonance and control color. Mm -hmm. That I don't think there's very few orchestras that do that, but Boston does. There is um, just a palette of colors. And again, I think it's an amazing hall. You're, it's, it's a little easier to do that in that, mm -hmm. in that space. Um, but I think that's something about my playing that I'm um, always trying to bring out. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's something I, it came up maybe yesterday in a lesson with someone. Um, one of the things I do with all my new incoming students, it doesn't matter what the level is, is I have them physically write down two columns. And one are things that they feel they naturally do well or they're confident about in their playing um, that they know they can always rely on in their playing. Uh, that can be hard for some of the younger players. They're not really mm -hmm. at that point. But then the other column are things that they, they know they need to work on. There's some they're, they need to refine further and develop. And one of the many reasons I do this is because I found when I was under pressure, especially with audi orchestral auditions, your mind immediately goes to what you can't do. You know, it's oh, it's like that with everything. <laughs> thing is going to get me, but yeah. I found if I if I could transfer that to what I know I naturally do well, mm -hmm. which would be I felt for me was my sound and how I could create this palette of colors in my sound. That if I focused on that, even if there are some technical errors, it will override any of those, because it will stand out as is something special in my life. Mm -hmm. And so I, I try to do that with my students and also with myself when I play, that there's always stuff that's going to come in. It's never going to be exactly how I want it. But if I can um, really think about bringing it across what I know I do well, um, I, it's usually more successful. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, I think it's always an evolution what we do. And cer certainly tonal production is something that it, it's it's hard to describe to a lot of people, but it definitely is something that keeps changing, you know, with age and experience and that sort of thing. Um, I think if it doesn't, then there's a real problem, <laughs> you know, it's just something that it's part of the instrument. It's a part of the extension of what we're doing, you know? So, um, so let's shift a little bit about our topic here um, and talk about in the, in a perfect world and sort of the or orchestral excerpt world and, and auditions and things like that. What would you like to see, like, if you had, you know, the choice of, of, of changing the process or, or at least giving some adjustments to the process, what would you like to see in, in auditions for, for, let's just talk about clarinet since we're doing that. Yeah, I mean, there's, there is no perfect process. They're mm -hmm. all flawed. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think it's, I do appreciate the, you know, just going over what we do in the U in the U.S. for auditions mm -hmm. with the screened audition. And um, I think that's important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I do think, though, in my experience, when we've hired people in the different orchestras I've played in, um, there is a big difference, or there can be a big difference between someone sounding really good in an audition mm. and working really well in the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And finding maybe a bit more of a balance of that. It's mm -hmm. so it's so focused on uh, the candidate alone on stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's one important part of it. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so having, I think it is nice to have some kind of trial or chamber music round and how you interact. And that, I think that's hap that does happen here or there, but a lot of times it's, you know, a hundred people show up yeah. and at the end of the end of the couple of days, you got one person who came out at the end. Mm -hmm. And sometimes mm -hmm. that works out and sometimes it doesn't. And how are they going to work with that particular section? And um, mm -hmm. how quickly can you adjust? I mean, that's it, that's really difficult to hear when you're alone on stage. Mm -hmm. How do you play an ensemble? What are you listening for? What are you looking at? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, are you looking at the conductor only? Are you looking at the concert master? Are you looking at the principal cello when you've got something with that section? Those are things you can't you can't tell when you're sitting alone on stage, and so um, maybe having more of a balance of that. I mean, that it gets into more logistical things of time and how can you fit sure. that season. It's not as easy as just like let's have more trials. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I think the piano world went through this a number of years ago, and 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 piano competitions where they have started to open up their their auditions for you know, the big sort of competitions to interviews, you know, maybe some um, doing some outreach kind of uh, concerts, you know, as well as maybe chamber music and things like that. I, I mean, it gives maybe a little more of a clear picture of the, of the whole uh, a musician side of everyone, you know, and I think that's something that I've always wanted that to be injected into the process somehow, because I think that that is, you know, uh, such an important part of, of, of the job. Right. And, 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 uh, certainly that's, it's complicated, but you're right. It's so much of it is about time and how much time it takes. And, 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 um, you know, I always thought the, the, um, the process in Japan was really interesting because the whole orchestra shows up for the auditions, you know, and they're sitting in the hall and everyone votes, you know, and, and that's a really interesting process. Um, I always felt that was uh, not a bad way to go. Um, so talking about, you know, what we both do, which is teaching the conservatory type environment, um, I'd like to sort of get your thoughts on, you know, the type of students you're hearing today and, and sort of prospective students and things like that, things that you'd like to um, – just point out as being things that you're listening for and or things that you find are really amazing about today's youth. And so uh, I'm just curious about any thoughts on that. There's, there's a lot of, a lot of great players and a lot of great talent out there. Um, I think we have, we've maybe talked about this before, but again, looking back at when I was studying with you, I remember vividly just obsessively listening to recordings. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember going into your studio and you had a um, filing cabinet full of CDs mm. that we could check out or listen to. CDs, what are those? <laughs> um, I'm surprised it wasn't eight tracks. <laughs> <laughs> and I would just... I, I tell my students now in, the, in studio classes here that um, it wasn't just, oh, I turned this recording on and I listened to this Beethoven symphony. I, I listened to every single recording I could find, but it wasn't just even listening to the recording. I knew the date in which it was recorded. Mm -hmm. I knew everyone who was in the section. Um, and it wasn't just out there. I would do research. Yeah ask people i would look at the the booklet that came with the recording to see if it was listed in there and oh this right. person here and this era of this orchestra this is what i really like to listen to um because there's people who come in who are incredible players to audition but taking sounding like they've never heard the piece before mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, like, i don't know a beethoven symphony and if you don't know that the tempos that are written are not traditionally done. Mm -hmm. They would just come in, they say, oh, quarter note equals 60, right. play it at 60, which is really, traditionally, you don't play it that way. Just to be able to do that listening, the fascinating thing is that it's so much more accessible 
than it ever has been, but people are seemingly listening less or not listening. I had one of the classes I did uh, at the end of the semester when it was all online is I did, a, I shared my screen with everyone and I showed everyone how I find music online. Mm -hmm. So now I, if I go to Spotify, what do I search for? How do I search for it? How do I find good recordings? I don't randomly go on YouTube and whatever thing that pops up, I press play. Mm -hmm. You know, that I'm actually finding uh, I, it's interesting. I mean, I, I agree with it. In fact, one of the things that annoys me about the saturation of what we're what we have now is the fact that it doesn't show necessarily who's who's playing, you know, or, or you know, like it, it sometimes it's, it's just totally not even on the recording jack at all at all, you know, so, so then you've got to guess as you know, then you can try to find the date that it was recorded and stuff like that but it's like impossible unless you're really you know searching the corners of the internet for that i mean it, it really is difficult um i totally agree with you i think that's something that is uh it was part of the society you know growing up uh, for for us and and you know i mean i still think about you know someone a couple of days ago was playing shostakovich one and like in my mind i immediately think of CSO with Larry Combs. I mean, like, it's like one of the great recordings of Larry, you know, and I, and, you know, like, I just think about those things. Like we sort of memorize those things. Like we did phone numbers back then, <laughs> you know, um, you probably had cell phones. All right. Did you have cell phone in high school? No, no, was, you didn't. I got one of the first ones. That was my, my first year in college. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, there were other things we, we sort of paid attention to, you know, like, and, and I mean, for me, what's really kind of a crazy world is that one of the very first CD I think I ever had was Frederick Fennell and the Eastman went on so long, you know, like it was definitely one of the great recordings of, of whole, um, whole suites and, and stuff, you know, all the, the incredible went on some music. Um, yeah, no, I, I totally understand. What other things in, in sort of perspective students in, in clarinet technique or tone or anything like that that you find is something that you're having to, to work on or combat with, with students a lot? It all goes back to fundamentals. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, again, I'll just broken record here. My <laughs> team, I was so fortunate with having such a solid foundation playing the clarinet. And I didn't really have, there's people who study with one person and we get them on, they get them on a good track. And then they study with someone else who has a completely different track and you're sort of swimming around. I was so consistent. Um, and so most of the time I'm working at a minimum, the, you know, even for advanced players, I'm going to take the first semester they're here and we're going to make our way through all the fundamentals. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, Again, even going back to what I was talking about when I was in Kansas City, even if people have good fundamentals, they don't know why. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. one of my biggest things that I try to do is, I remember being in Kansas City calling you and calling Fred, asking about things because I knew what I should do, but I didn't know really why I was doing it or how I was doing it all. And so I want my students that when they're out of here, they're, they're not studying with me on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. They have the knowledge to diagnose and fix issues that will arise because they will. Mm, and definitely. So, um, it's going over all those fundamentals and either reinforcing what they're already doing, uh, but also telling them why they're doing it and why it works and why it doesn't. And this is, uh, I think, just to empower them that they have the knowledge once they get out that they can continually improve yeah it's interesting that you you talk about that i i remember very clearly uh during those years at interlochen that uh, there was a really big shift in sort of the the society of musicians and how musicians were looking at music and 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 maybe they were starting to consider other things at the same time and you know more people are starting to do that i feel like we're they're really considering you know, other fields in combination with music. And I think that's really an important thing. And I, 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 I think it's, I mean, for me, you know, looking back from my early years, there's like no way I could have done that, you know, but, but some of the talent that we have now that are able to just do so many things so well, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, but I remember very specifically having a, a specifically having a conversation 
with some of my colleagues in, in talking about that there was a real shift of, of student thinking in that now you have to, as a teacher, you have to explain why and why we do certain things. And because there were many generations before that, that, you know, you just did what they, your teachers told you to do, right? And, and, and hope, hope for the best, you know, and that, and that was certainly a, a really a, a long period of time where, where that was the way it was. And, and you just accepted that. And, and there was a real shift, you know, in, in, you know, why am I doing this? You know, how is it going to make me successful? And, 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 and so, and I think that has continued to be the case uh, throughout the years, you know, I think, um, which I think is great. I mean, I think some amazing talent out there. It's just, it's kind of crazy, really. <laughs> some of the things I'm hearing with some of these young players, you know. Um, so, in, and I, we're almost out of time as far as our, our conversation here um, before we get into the, the, the questions. But I guess one of the things that I um, also wanted to ask you, just sort of, you know, in the shift of, of in the careers that you've you're, you're that you've been doing, like in the orchestra, and now you're at Eastman and teaching at Eastman, and what um, what's been the hardest thing for you to adjust in that the different world? The most recent switch, or yeah, yeah. Um, Uh, it's been pretty easy. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. There's been very difficult shifts over the years. Sure. So, you know, this past year playing in the BSO for 11 years and then coming to Eastman, um, after playing three or four concerts every single week and then coming here to Eastman, it's been a pretty easy shift. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so... You know, this is a completely different world, though. It's the, you know better than I do, but it's um, finding finding how how my days go and my weeks go mm -hmm. is a change. You know, I don't have these set rehearsals every single day, every single week. I can mm -hmm. I can dictate more what I do and, and and make my own schedule and work with the students and be flexible, which is um, which has been nice. Um, I would imagine too, you know, you're starting to explore repertoire that you've never been able to do before. So that's yeah. probably pretty exciting. To be thinking about something other than what's the next mm -hmm. subscription week, what's next week. It's, yeah, I've got this project I can do. What kind of repertoire can I play? I, you know, I'm calling you all the time. Like, what should I do? What <laughs> <laughs> group? I don't know what to play. Um, but so that's been really fascinating to explore. Cool. Well, congratulations on everything. Very, very excited for you. And thank you for doing this. This is wonderful. So, Sean, if you're still around there, maybe you can come back and give us some questions from, from uh, Facebook. Popping back in here. Thanks, both of you guys, for a really great discussion. I, I don't even know where to start, Michael, because I absolutely love your philosophy about um, not, not rote learning, but truly understanding when you're teaching and, and even being a musician. And I, I feel that that's really a way that, or the only way that maybe art can advance. Um, I was wondering if kind of you could expand on that a bit. Like, did you feel that this mentality is something you really try and instill for artistic reasons or more just for understanding or, or just a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, it, it goes back to, um, uh, having a really clear foundation in music so I can then expand on that. Foundation in music, foundation in playing. And I want all my students to do that. I've been saying that recently to a bunch of my students that um, it's actually disappointing for me if I give students very, very specific exercises and things to do, and they just do exactly what I do for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I've found that over the years. That's not very fulfilling for me as a teacher. The mo one of the most fulfilling things I'll give I'll give students an exercise. And they'll come back and they'll either question things with it um, or they'll come up with a completely different uh, variation of that exercise. And I think that's brilliant. That's what I want. I don't want cookie cutter versions of me. Um, but there's a philosophy that I think will, I will, that will carry down, but I want the individuals to have something to say. Yeah. Um, 
and it's even like going back to that warm-up exercise Richard gave me when I was 15. It was a Fred Orman exercise, the five-note Behrman mm. scale. And I know I, Fred always told me that Carrie still does that too. Um, I do that every single day. I do it much. I do it in a much different way than Fred taught or you taught, um, and it works for me. But it's still that underlying foundation is there. And so it's, you know, giving the tools that you, um, you've got the foundation and you know how to expand from there and to put your own stamp musically and artistically in what you do. Well, and I definitely find that the best teachers as well are doing exactly what you said is they had to learn it for themselves. So they figured out a way to explain it because they had to explain it to themselves. There's so many people who seem to just get something and when they get it, they tend not to dig deeper to think about why they get it. But it sounds like even the stuff that you are getting, you tend to also dig deeper just out of curiosity and a need to explain it. The way my mind works is I, I sort of, if someone comes in and has an issue, my mind goes to how do I, how can I reverse engineer what they're doing to figure out exactly what's wrong with what they're doing and how can I improve it? And it was even sitting in the section in Boston. I mean, I would sit there, the section is amazing. And I would sit there and there's certain things that I would hear people play that I, there's no way I could do. And so I would sit there and in my mind, okay, what are they exactly, what are they doing physically to get that type of articulation, that sound? And I could put, I could figure that out. And so when someone plays, you know, the running joke is I'll have a prospective student come in and they ask what I want to hear. Or I've got all this stuff to play. And I just tell them, we can talk about just playing open G. I can talk for an hour. I can tell exactly what's going on here and what we need to work on. Just playing open G. Uh, they never do that, but like, I don't need to hear, <laughs> you know, Nielsen, Mozart, Weber, and excerpts for an hour lesson. Um, so I think that's, it's, it's listening, but knowing the cause and effect of every little nuance that happens in one's playing. And I can take that and figure out what's working and what's not. So this kind of segues into the first question that came in here. This is from um, Erica Smith. Now, you talked a little bit about how you had uh, felt inexperienced at the beginning as a player. But she was wondering, did you feel these kind of challenges when you first started teaching as well, or, or because of your background, maybe with explaining, you felt um, very comfortable. I mean, how was this for you? I think what, in my life, I look back, I thrive on being the, the least experienced person in the room mm -hmm. or the least knowledgeable person in the room. I, I love that. And I love working my way, developing and working through that. And it's, I did that when I was in Michigan, I got there and I was not the best. I was, I, I came to Interlock and I was not the best and worked my In way. fact, I remember you being in the third clarinet at Interlochen. <laughs> the third clarinet? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the back row. You were oh, in the no, back we'll row. We'll have to cut this part out. No one wants to admit playing third clarinet. <laughs> my seatings were in all of them. I was on the back row. <laughs> went ensemble once and then I went back to the orchestra. <laughs> you know, that's I, good. I give that advice to band teachers though. I often say like, if you want your clarinet section to get better, stop putting the best player on first all the time. Send him down to third and get those other players up on the top parts. And, and the first player will sometimes discover too how hard it is to play a supporting role. Mm -hmm. um, I actually feel sometimes that one thing lacking in college education is the, uh, the training to play second clarinet, which a lot of people end up doing, you know, to be a really supportive, great, great players it's a hard hard job yeah no one taught me how to play second clarinet and then i'm playing second in the boston symphony so it was that was learning quickly on the job what to do mm. i was i was started off as second in e flat kansas city then i was principal then i went to second in boston it's just like um it uh there's an art to playing it well and a lot of people don't don't really understand what that is. And it's, I think only being in that seat a lot, uh, you learn you learn that. But in, in terms of the, the question, you know, it was the same thing in Boston. I remember getting, getting to Boston, like this is so out of my league. I, I should not be here. Mm -hmm. uh, but then over time you develop, you, I, I think I developed it as a musician, as a player. And, uh, and same thing here. I mean, I had already been teaching at New England Conservatory for 11 years before I came to Eastman, so I sort of knew generally. Um, but I don't like the politics of what happens between faculty and meetings and 
that was all new to me, and so that took a little while to, to develop, but um, it's a pretty easy transition. It was mainly the playing stuff that was took some time to figure out. So you have an incredible like confidence, though, to be able to admit that you prefer to be the one in the room who knows the least. Like, do you have any advice as far as like that sort of humble uh, sense? I mean, a lot of people really struggle and prefer to put themselves in a position of of being um, not surrounded by people who are truly going to advance them. I'm just again the couple things that I'm really interested in. One of which is music and clarinet. Um, I want to learn more. You know, I, I'm not, I never claim that I know everything and I, I am the authority. I'm constantly trying to listen to things that are completely different than I've ever heard it or thought about it. Mm-hmm. And that's fascinating to me. Um, and so uh, talking to people who play in a completely different way than I do um, is, I think, only helps me as a player and a teacher. So I'm, you know, I try to seek out people like that or be friends with people who know a lot more on certain subjects than I do and reach out to them for guidance and and uh, and not just be I'm the authority on this and I, you know, I'm all known. Yeah, we're all we're all students of music all the time. Yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. So there's a few more questions about education here. I'll try and uh, answer a couple of them. So Jasmine Green said, can you specify any fundamentals or technical books that you like to use? So the fundamentals I I spoke about that I do every single day are all ones that I've developed over the years, so they're not from any book. But in terms of technical exercises, I always go back to the same sort of rotation, which would be Behrman Book 3. I'm always doing that. Uh, Zsa Zsa Vadi Makem. I played through a lot when I was in Kansas City, and they're good just for getting the fingers going. Is there's the the Opperman velocity studies, um, and a variety of etudes. I still have every single one of my students. I don't care what level they're at. The first thing they do with me is slow rose etudes. The grads, you know, grad students come in, they think they're ready to win an audition, and I want them to bring in rose number one. Yeah. No, so I haven't done this since I was in high school, but it's very, very valuable musically and just to learn structure of a phrase. And so I'll play through Rose Etudes, but I'm playing through Bach, I'm playing through, um, lately I've been, I've gone, it's been interesting this past year, I've really gone back to assessing what I was taught in school. And so I've gone through different techniques that Fred Orman taught in Cavallini Caprices, Mm -hmm. um, that at the time, honestly, I didn't think were very valuable. I fought him on, and he was not happy. Um, and now I look back, and I have a completely different uh, understanding of them. And so I've been actually with a lot of my students too, going through a handful of the Cavallini Caprices for different technical um, issues. And so I think generally those are the books that I use. And how do you go about keeping these, even for yourself, fresh? Well, you know, those, the, the few things I do every single day, they never get old because I can never, I'm never satisfied. I'm it's just, it's never exactly how I want it. So I'm constantly building, trying to um, improve it and get it right. Um, the technical things, I'm just, I'm always varying it up because I will get old. If I do a Zsa on body make them for four or six weeks, it's just like mindless practice. It's a waste of my time because I just, I, I'm not thinking at all and I just go through it. But if I haven't done it for six months, it's really valuable. I can, you know, it's like, wow, this is, I really need this. Um, So I switch that stuff up. Articulation, I switch every every couple weeks, the exercises I do, and I still do. uh, There's a variety of things that I do that I've developed, but I'll do, go through the Kell book. Um, I'll play through um, a lot of things I do for articulation. I just take standard rose ages and I articulate all of them. so those are generally what I would do. Love that. And a lot of really good coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I asked my professor in university, I was like, is it okay to drink while I'm playing in the coffee as long as I you know, don't put cream and sugar? And he's like, how else are you going to play? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I like it. <laughs> I have this theory that it helps coat the inside too. <laughs> the, the beans, yeah. the oils and the beans or whatever. 
Um, so you had talked about anchor tonguing and how this is a problem that you had. So Alexis Fong Castillo asks if you could sort of explain some of the ways you got out of that and if you have any exercises to improve on tonguing specifically. Um, that's a big question. Uh, I'll go back to, to sort of a, uh, the general motto and philosophy of playing, which is little by little and taking time. It takes time. And so it's starting very slowly of just taking an open G and getting the right tongue placement, but also air. And I'll just quickly say this. It is really, it's taken me years to understand how the air and tongue work. Um, and I think the misconception I always had, probably because I made that switch early on, was that my tongue was a muscle that I needed to train as if I was going to the gym. And that is, in my opinion, completely wrong. And I did it for years. And it's, it's really about um, the air and the way you use your air with a very light tongue stroke. And so instead of being like 80% muscle with your tongue and being able to control, control speed and um, accuracy, it's more like 90% air, 10% tongue, just a very light, efficient tongue with very, very focused air strain. And I think when you're, if you were to move from anchor to more traditional, I'm not gonna say, I do not like saying tip of the tongue to tip of the reed, but you know, more the front of the tongue. Um, it's not just focusing on the tongue. It's really about how you're using an air with a very light tongue onto the reed. Um, and that takes a long time to figure out. Starting in the lower, easier, easier register to articulate. You know, like going back to the Cavallini I was talking about, a perfect exercise to start would be Cavallini number 10 and doing that slowly to get the right tongue stroke and air, balance of air and tongue. Um, so there's a lot more to that, but that's a, a starting point of just um, developing. Just so everybody is clear, the recording edition of the Cavallini is number 10, but the IMSLP version is number seven, I believe it is. To serve it's all 16th note starts on low a yeah yeah well i love that that description though because i think that one of the problems that people have with tonguing and i've encountered this with students too is they say well how can you help me with my tonguing it sounds so you know choppy and loud and scoopy and all these different things right and they all should almost approach it more as airing <laughs> because the the tongue has never started the reed vibrating it only stops the air from you know going through momentarily right so um, no matter how hard you try if there's no air there won't be any tonguing so it's very, very weird. Got a couple more questions here. We'll try and do one more. Um, Mary Bakun asks, she says, I appreciate the cognitive, uh, I appreciate, these are big words. <laughs> I appreciate the cognitive approach you take to your teaching. Have you studied cognitive behavior models or is it just a natural intuitive teaching model? I know nothing except the clarinet. So no, I don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And uh, also a question from Maury Bakun. He says, could you please talk about your different approaches when playing um, second as opposed to principal in an orchestra? And we, we kind of touched on this, but uh, okay. I think it's such an interesting question. I'll give you a really fancy, fast answer that um, goes against what pretty much everything I've ever heard in my life is that I play second clarinet exactly how I play principal clarinet. The mm. difference is the context in the music. So you know that? Oh, sorry. Well, it's like principal clarinet, and uh, I don't have the melody, I am not going to lead the section. And it happens, though, that the second clarinet has a lot less prominent solo parts. So you have to know how you work in with the rest of the wind section, the, the rest of the orchestra. If I'm playing second clarinet and I have a solo, I will play as a principal player. I will bring it out um, as, as an ensemble player. Um, I know when I need to back off. Um, and just make blend, do a lot of blending ensemble with ensemble when I'm playing the lower octave and really bring that out so the principal player can float on top with ease. Um, so I think there's a lot of talk about this is how you specifically play second clarinet. And I think it's more the context and um, 
what you're doing in the music, what the composer wrote in the music. And so the way I play isn't dramatically different. It's just, it, for me, the transition from first to second was less prominent solo passages. And so getting my mind out of constantly being, you know, uh, in the spotlight and knowing when I need to let other players through. But I think that works. All the great principal players do the same thing. Yeah. In fact, Stanley Drucker basically said the, ex the exact same thing. He said, uh, I was asking him about orchestral playing and he was like, you know, you got to know when to listen and be supportive and when to be soloistic. And um, with, I think that some people, you know, sometimes we forget that in an orchestra, all the wind seats are solo chairs, really. It's not like section violin or it's not like being in a wind orchestra where there's 42 clarinets and, and uh, you know, if you're the 40th third clarinet, you're really there for, uh, to prop up the sound to compete with the tenor saxophones. <laughs> um, but in an orchestra, the second clarinet is, comes through just as much as the first clarinet, especially if they're having parts to trade off or they're playing at different times and in, in different, with different instruments. So, I mean, to look at it and definitely uh yeah and it's, it's just learning how to balance that out and not i always uh you hear a lot I of lost sound there are we still yeah. hearing we can still hear you okay um a lot of times mm -hmm. with second well, i have lost sound so i'm not sure if everyone else is hearing still we can hear you yeah you just your screen's from i'll text them yeah yeah it seems like we're losing but you can hear me yeah yeah Keep going, Mike. No, I just, the, a lot of times you'll hear second players who just sort of like, are they playing? Is there, is there anything there? Are they, are they, uh, you know, are they playing backstage? And I, to me as a player, I just wanted the entire section to, when they had something prominent, they were able to bring it out. And uh, when you don't, you know how to work within a section and balance. And I think with every position in the section, you need to be able to do that. Yeah, but, absolutely. It's, it's so much uh, the art of that has always been, I think, if, if anything, much harder than any other job in the orchestra in a way because, because you're trying to balance it uh, so, so often, right? And being so aware of your surroundings at all times. Um, yeah. Every time, every yeah. time I've been playing principal in Boston, which is very few times, but if I played like in the Pops and I played principal, it was the easiest week of my season. Mm-hmm. It's just because I, I wasn't having to, I'm playing second. I was constantly analyzing what everyone had. Where am I fitting into this? How can I balance this? Who's got this where? And when I was playing more of the solo line. I could just focus on the solo line and not about everything else that was going on. So it's, uh, you know, um, it is difficult to do it well. It is, it is. Michael, thank you so much. I think we need to wrap up our, our visit today. I, I would um, like to just thank all of everyone that's that's here and listening and, and asking questions today. Um, this has been a really wonderful um, experience during these interviews and, and we're gonna, uh, this is our last one for now, um, but a big thanks uh, to the support uh, teams of, from uh, Beckham Musical and, and Clarine e with Sean and, uh, we hope that all of you uh, stay safe in this summer and, and find inspiration uh, to continue your work as, uh, as artists and musicians and educators and, and uh, through these complicated times. And we wish uh, everyone the best. So, oh, there's Sean, you're back, great. You somehow just came in for the end here. Um, that's but, great, yeah, great. Just heard your little outro, that's perfect, <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't know if you said this, Richard, but these conversations, including the ones you had with Bakun, will be available on the Bakun and Clarity YouTube channels. So in the coming weeks, if you want to check these out and uh, even request more people to talk to or various things like that, you can do that at uh, youtube.com slash Bakun Musical or youtube.com slash Clarinet. So thank you so much for both of you taking the time today. And I'm sorry I dropped out at the end there. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you, Michael. Great to see you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks very much.